and have a completely democratic orientation. The existence of these organizations is in, it, is in itself proof that there is a revolution in art, because none having their social scope existed five years ago. These organizations and others are the vehicle through which American artists can think out their social and art problems and give them effect, effective expression. The federal support of art is another sign that there is a revolution in art, because aside from its economic aspect, it has placed art in the category of essential federal social services. This raises the cultural level, and I hope the American people don't let short-sighted politicians take this service away from them. Yes, there is a revolution in the arts. There always was a revolution in the arts, and I think it's a darn good thing. Thank you, Mr. Davis. To paraphrase Macbeth, is this a revolution that I see before me? For quite another point of view, on what artists are up to, we shall call on Mr. Albert Stirner, distinguished painter and member of the National Academy. His works are on display in such places as the Metropolitan, the Toronto, and the Carnegie Institute Museums on this continent, and in Europe, in the South Kensington Museum, and in the Royal Collection of the King of Italy. Mr. Sterner has helped to found and lead several organizations of artists. He's an instructor in the Art Students League and in the School of Design for Women here in New York City. Mr. Sterner. <clears throat> Lop off the R from revolution and you have evolution. Evolution sustains and maintains R. At 17, I landed in Chicago soon after the Great Fire. There and then, I revolted. I revolted against business. Circumstances have forced me to be in business. I think I'm still in revolt against business. Once and for all, I declared my independence. I had decided, decided to become an artist and nothing else. Like all revolutionists, I was often hungry and cold. But I always managed to have a drawing board. In all the 60 years of my practice, I have not seen any revolution in the art. But I have seen many fashions come and go. In the long, slow evolution of art, in its age-old course, experiments which have taken place and will take place all fall in line. The Dadaists, the Vortices, the Cubists, the Virgulists, the Pointillists, the Forbes, the Surrealists, and all the other cults, isms and osms, slight boils on the eternal body of art, I call them, live their short lives and disappear, just as the ridiculous little buns and snoods on the heads of the women today will do. <laughs> Hakusai, the greatest of the Japanese artists at 99 years of age on his deathbed, said, if heaven had lent me but five years more, I might have been a great draftsman. True artists are all like Hokusai. They go down, flags flying, and the legend on the flag is, it might have been better. But today, it is the fashion to deny fundamental principles in all the arts. It is decreed that competent technique is of little account, that intrinsic beauty of paint on the canvas, although there are many kinds, is of no importance that absurd distortions and deformations are the unlimited privilege of the artist, that drawing, as it has been known through the ages, is useless, that color values build form, that masterly composition is negligible, that only self-expression, the peculiar and particular eccentricity of the artist, is worthwhile. To believe that any art or craft may disregard tradition is simply absurd. It is by the handing on of the experience and discoveries of one generation of workmen to the next that all art and craft, in fact everything we know, has come about. Evolution, not revolution, sustains and maintains art. What if I say to you that there is no such thing as modern art, unless by that term is meant all the art made in this period? There is only good and bad art. And, oh, my friends, there is the marketplace, commercialism, advertising, and publicity. 
There are great innovators, but there are also tricksters, and there are charlatans, often aided and abetted by the weak and the wealthy dilettante. A mass of so-called art dished out today in the marketplace and in countless exhibitions advertised and fantastically publicized is gulped down, hook, bait, and sinker by the fashion mongers. If an artist chooses, with his tongue in his cheek, to put a horse's tail on a human body and call it a head, he will probably make the front page and be displayed in the more fashionable of our museums. <laughs> but you and I may still have our own opinion. Walt Whitman said, to have great poets, we must have great audiences. I hear many of you say, I don't know about art, but I know what I like. If you would only have the courage to state as definitely what you don't like, then if you compare your decisions based only on your own feelings, you might form a valid opinion which is your own. You might then become one of the great audience for which Walt Whitman pleaded. Some art historians claim that environment, environment makes art epochs and their artists. I disagree with that whether he is at work on the frieze of the Parthenon or the temples of Egypt and China, or whether in our own land he is at work today, wherever he is found, the master artist is in all time an emotional individualist. As such, he is ill-adapted to any or union regimentation. Unlike the scientist, the artist neither proves probes nor proves. He feels, he conceives, he creates. The propagandist themes of racial persecution, capital and labor, squabbling unions, and economic unrest in the world, necessarily and well presented by the cartoonist, are doubtful subject matter for permanent fine art. The cold mechanistic pseudo-scientific manifestations the bald, ugly realism which in recent years have come to invade the arts can bear only sterile fruit in our scheduled lives. For art stands above propaganda. 